Hey everyone, today we have our special reoccurring guest, Matt, the Lumberjack Landlord, and we're going to be discussing how you can actually find deals through motivated sellers. So welcome, Matt, to the channel. I'm super excited to be here, and this is one of my near and dear topics because after all, the market's crashing. The market's <laughs> cr it's crashing right now. Just listen, it's crashing. Yeah, it's not crashing. It's definitely correcting. There's definitely some softness that we see, but you know, uh, in years of my conversation, one of the things we talked about was finding that motivated seller, um, which is which can be the toughest thing to do. So there's a bunch of different ways that I do it. Um, but far be it from me when I'm having a conversation, I like to do off market stuff. So I'll make some phone calls, I'll see, you know, sometimes a for sale by owner, I'll look at Craigslist, believe it or not, I just bought a deal off of Craigslist. Um, not even joking. It's the most expensive thing I ever bought off of Craigslist. I bought a $350,000 house off of Craigslist. Do a lot of um, people post their houses on Craigslist? You'd be surprised. Yeah. Okay. You'd be surprised. I was like, what the hell? They're selling houses on Craigslist. <laughs> this is the third deal I found on Craigslist. The third one. Do you find so, like it's particular like type of seller that posts on Craigslist versus like another platform? Um, so far, yeah, the only thing that I found is common out with commonality is that they all hate real estate agents. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. And that can be for any number of reasons. But this last one that I found, he had owned the property for over 40 years. Um, that's how he found his tenants was on Craigslist. And he's just like, I don't want to deal with it. He's like, I don't want to deal with a broker. I don't want to put it on Zillow. So I'm getting a call from every, you know, Tom, Dick and Harry trying to get a hold of me. He's like, so I just want to put it somewhere where I think the only thing that I'm going to get is somebody who's trying to buy something. And so he put it out there. I had a conversation with him. It was a great conversation. Um, and then he called me back the next day and said, you don't, you didn't get the deal. Somebody else did. And I was like, what the hell? That doesn't happen. And I was like, how rude. Um, and then I just said, well, you know what? I said, sounds good. I said, really sorry to hear that. I know we can get a deal done. If for any reason, the guy in front of you starts to falter at all, just let me know. I get the call two weeks later. Yep. He DQ'd, he fell apart. Wow. So uh, if you still want the deal, it's yours. I was like, yep. He goes, so the same price. I said, yep, I'm not going to beat you up. The price was fine. Um, so I bought it 350. It was a five unit. Um, it appraised for just under 400. And with my minor work that I'll do to it, because the rents were so below market, almost all of the rents in that building will double. Wow. That's excellent. Yep. And here's the thing. This is the part of talking to a person who's owned it for 40 years, mm -hmm. right? So if you want to put yourself in a position to find motivated sellers, let's face it. What are people looking at in owning a property for another year? There's the potential for lockdowns this winter again. There's certainly the potential since we have to pay for all of these awesome things that Washington wants us to pay for that we can't just keep on printing money but I digress. There's going to be tax increases. Those tax increases are, they've already told you what they're going to be. It's 39.7% capital gains. They're also talking about eliminating the 1031 exchange, which is something that almost every investor uses to get out of a property and then buy something else or get into something else taxes deferred. So if you're getting rid of all these things that give you the ability to sell your property and actually finally get your payday, well, I'm having that conversation with a bunch of older landlords. We're having that conversation. Yeah. How was last winter for you? Oh, it's the worst. Right. Great. I can buy your property right now. Mm -hmm. The other cool thing too is we talk, or I talk a lot to people about either A, seller financing. So if they own it outright and they don't want to have this big, you know, there's nothing worse than making $70,000 a year, your entire life. And then all of a sudden on a blips on one radar screen, you all of a sudden made $400,000 one year. That's a problem because you pay taxes based on that. That's not a good idea because it wasn't your primary residence. It wasn't investment property. So you're paying taxes based on that sale of $400,000. The problem with that is poof. It's either you know 20% long-term capital gain. Maybe it's 39.7 if that gets approved. If you made $400,000 on something, do you want to write a check for 80 grand for the government doing nothing? No, no. thank you. <laughs> you do not. I do not anyway. I'm not going to say what Ariel wants to do, No, nope. but I wouldn't think you'd want to. So the key for that deal is you can talk to them about seller financing. If they own it outright, you can say, well, why don't you give me a note for five years? 
I'll do interest only for five years and then I'll pay it off. But seller financing, there's a ton of different things out there you can find on YouTube. I won't cover all the particulars about that, but that's finding a motivated seller. In this particular case, they're on Craigslist. They own it for a lot of time. He said, nope, I don't care about, he's like, I'm set up to have this thing sell and I'll just pay the 20% long-term or you know, long-term capital gain. I said, sure, no problem. So I just got a regular mortgage and bought the thing. Um, that's so we talk a lot about you know finding those motivated sellers. One is look in your city's tax records for delinquency and taxes. That's another thing to look at. I found people that are three years behind on their property taxes. Wow. Well, year number four, guess what? The city files and they file to take your house back. Mm -hmm. So that person's going to be motivated to sell and at least say, listen, with all the appreciation that you've gotten over the last three years just by itself, Yes, you have a liability of fifteen thousand dollars in property taxes, but your house is now worth three hundred. You bought it for two hundred or one hundred and fifty. You can sell this, get out from underneath that. I can pay that off, and then you can go buy something else because you'll have enough cash to do so. So it's the opportunity to put together something that isn't on market, um, because largely speaking, people aren't going to put something that's you know three years uh, behind in taxes. They're not going to put that on the market because that will be found during a due diligence process in most cases. And what do you think of certain um, platforms out there like prop streams or list source that try sure. to extract that information? Do you find that those are reliable or like good strategies to go to or better just to go straight into your city's uh, website? So I think that, yeah. So I think that those are good. Um, you know, if you want to pay for that service, um, cause that's something that costs you money and it's pretty cheap. It's not too expensive. So, you know, those are, those are ways to go. If you want to do the work yourself, you can look at, you, know, you can actually go to the city stuff and actually see that yourself. Um, the other thing too, is, um, as you're looking, anything that hits the market, you can instantly look up who the owner is. If you see that it's owned by a trust or by an estate or something like that, guess what? they're likely going to be a motivated seller. They're not going to want to do any work. They're not going to want to hear anything about inspections yeah. or, well, we want this fixed or we want that fixed. The key is finding somebody in that position that, again, something tragic has happened in their family, but they have an asset that they now need to unload to either pay off debt or pay off the mortgage because no one wants to pay that mortgage. I just did a deal like that. They put it on the market for $399. They didn't did a price reduction to $349. I had a wholesaler call me and he says, hey, come take a look at this property. And I was like, it's way overpriced. And he's like, just come take a look at it. He goes, I, I have an in with the, with the broker. That, and he said, they're, they're ready to unload it. They want a cash deal. We got it under contract for 287. It's incredible. Yeah. From 400 to 287. <laughs> 400 to 287. So don't tell me there aren't deals out there. There are. Yeah. So we always preach, right? Your network is your net worth. So it's about having those relationships, people knowing what you're looking for. It's mm -hmm. also about being able to put it together a deal quickly. We walked it at 6 p.m. By 7 p.m., they had a PNS. By 9 p.m., we had an agreed to price. Wow. So we did a deal in three hours. Literally, I woke up that morning not even thinking about that building. By 9 p.m. that night, I was <laughs> on a contract for that building. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Yeah, so be flexible. But yeah, there's a ton of opportunity out there. So when you're looking for those you know, deals that other people are also looking for, it can be a state, it can be tax, they're behind in taxes. Um, it can be even age. One of the other things that I'll do is, is that if you look at the tax roll in cities, they'll say how long the person's owned the place. Mm -hmm. It will say, you know, they've owned it since whatever year. Um, I look at that stuff and, you know, I'll target when I'm reaching out and trying to call folks. Um, I'll literally call people that have owned their property for 40 years you yeah. know, or 45 years. Um, it's, it's always a thing. Anytime that we're doing a project in the neighborhood, we'll put a sign up. We'll also put flyers. We'll also do an open house when we're done the project. So we can have everybody in the neighborhood come take a look at it. And then we're, and when we tell them, we make first contact with them. If you ever decide that you want to sell your house, that's something where you don't want to do a bunch of work and inspections and all that other stuff. Let us know. There's other horrible companies out there that do that. Um, we'll say, what's the creative way to say this? So we don't get in trouble. They take the caveman approach not the lumberjack approach, but they take the caveman approach. Most cases, what they offer is only price of land. They don't okay. value the house at all. You know, I just was in, I've done, I went up against them in three deals in the last year. Their pricing was a joke. What they were offering people was absolutely sinful. It was like, you're really trying to steal this person's yeah. property. 
they owned somebody a hundred, they, they offered somebody $103,000 for their house on a lot. And I offered them and, and I said, well, I can pay you much more than that. Mm-hmm. They said, okay. And they said, that sounds good. And then they ended up taking that other person's offer because that person from that company said, yeah, I'd be really concerned with anybody that's just one off buying your house as opposed to a wow. real company like us. So that I told the woman, I said, I really feel bad. I said, I was, I said, look at, look at your email. You didn't get my email. I was offering to pay 115 grand for the house. Cost herself yeah. 12,000 bucks. Oh man. So, a lot of it's like relationship managing as well. It is. It's relationship management. It's people knowing that they can trust you. You know, you, again, it's, I'm not going, there are people that are very concerned about 39.7% capital gains tax. There are people that are concerned being landlords going into another COVID winter. So I'm not going to argue them the point. I'm going to say, understanding that's your concern. So I'm, I'm still in a position where I'm looking longer term. I'm young enough where I still can get 30 years out of a property. And so I'm still interested in buying. They're in their 60s or 70s. They're not 30 years into it. They want to be done. They've already owned it for 20 or 25 and the things might be probably debt free. Um, So there's just a lot of different ways to find those motivated sellers. None of them are super easy. You can certainly do, like you said, those different services out. Those are great, you know, but realize that anybody else in your area is calling on those too. Exactly. You know, had, so one thing we didn't touch, have you before looked on Craigslist or one of the sources of uh, houses that are for rent and then finding the landlords that way? Sure. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, there was um, a few times um, finding places where I was just like, man, that unit has been on the market forever. And I'll actually go and I'll look at it and I'll ask them in the email, am I meeting you or am I meeting a property manager? If I'm meeting a property manager, then it's probably not going to be a thing. But if I'm meeting the owner, you know, the other thing that you, you can do too is you can see how big they are, you know, not physically, but how big they are as an organization. So you can take the name, you can look up that property, see what it's being held as, and then look and see in the rest of the city, do they own any more stuff? Or even in the neighboring towns, do, the, do a little bit of research and see how much more they own. They might own two. Like I'm doing a deal with somebody right now. They own two duplexes. They've owned them for 40 years and they're just ready to get out. And so they're going to get an awesome exit because I know what they paid. 40 years ago, they paid for these two duplexes. They paid less than 60K a piece. Oh my gosh. (laughs) And they're going to be in the, they're going to be in the threes. So they're going to walk with a massive, massive windfall. And again, the only thing that we have to come to at this point is, does it make sense for them to either A, do seller financing B, maybe they don't want all the seller financing, but they say, you know what? We'll take a piece of it. We'll take a couple hundred of it. Because when they get that, what happens is, is that you pay that off over a term. When they, when you pay that off, all you're doing is paying off a loan. That's not taxable to them. Mm-hmm. That That's not taxable. So the key there is, is that it's a way, and there's a million ways to do this with LLCs and S corps and all this other crazy stuff. Um, but for them, they get themselves in a position where, they don't get this big windfall where it takes them four hundred thousand dollars in one year. All of a sudden, they go to a hundred thousand dollars a year for four years. Guess what? It's a much different tax bracket. It yeah. saves them not only that, but then they get monthly income for four years. That's interest only. Um, and so, yeah, it's a it's a great way to get a deal done when you can talk to people about if they want the option of you know seller financing. The one thing I would recommend is if that is part of your strategy, do not push people. Just ask them, have you considered it? And if you haven't, I, I would just ask that you talk to your accountant because I think your accountant will think you're the most brilliant person alive and it will help you in your retirement in a much cleaner way with a much lower tax liability. Great. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of different strategies that we could pursue to help both sides. And just because we're in this crashing market, as people (laughs) want to call it, because inventory is climbing back to normal. Um, There's still a lot of opportunity to yeah, find motivated sellers and get good deals on both ends. There really are. And the big thing is, is that, you know, for people that think they're going to wait and wait for the market to correct 30%, let's just say I'm wrong and it corrects 30%. When over a three or four year span, when that happens, you know, in, I think the biggest national decline was, I want to say it was like 08 or 09. And I think it was about 9%. 
was the biggest national decline. Other certain markets were hit harder and some weren't hit nearly as much. But the interesting thing was, is you think you're going to get a deal then? Rates aren't going to be 2.75%. They're going to be four and a half. And the bank is not going to want a 680 credit score. They're going to want a 780 credit score. I worked through the last crash. I bought through the last crash. I had almost an 800 credit score and cash, and the bank still wouldn't do deals with me. They were like, nope, we don't want to lever up any more assets. We're good. So I had to hunt for banks. I got one deal. Countrywide was willing to let me do a deal. And the rate was 10.125. Oh my gosh. (laughs) 10 and 8. And this is in 2000 and this is 2008, 2009. And I didn't do the deal because the deal was that bad with a 10 point, you know, 10 and, you know, 10 and an eighth uh, mortgage rate was just yeah. insane. So the, what ends up happening is, is that that's where you see the biggest wealth transfer is that people with cash and access to equity and access to cash, not even equity, but access to cash. They're the ones that end up buying all those deals because they don't need to get approved by a bank. They buy it in cash. I see. So that's why Wall Street bought so much in 08, 09, and 10. They were literally buying entire MLSs, 100, 200 units. They're like, yep, we'll buy them all. Sounds good. Yep, we'll buy them all. And it's because they can do it with cash. And mm-hmm. and some of them just sold, one of them just sold 7,000 units for $3 billion. Wow. Yeah. What the heck? Like that's a, <laughs> and, and, and their profit on that was insane insane. And the, here, the thing is, is that their math works because you're going to have a mortgage. They don't have mortgages. They're just looking yeah. for return on their capital. And so they were able to put it in an asset that was growing in value every year. And on top of that, they got this massive return on their capital because not only was the monthly on the rents and the cost there, but then the increased value over a 10 year period, it of made billions of dollars on that deal. So for what it's worth, like I said, people do the work, get in there. It's just math, but there's a thousand ways to find stuff. Um, and a lot of these third-party companies are great. And a lot of them, what have you seen? I've seen pricing between like 50 and hundred bucks a month on a lot of those yeah, products. Nothing, nothing it's too nothing bad. crazy. Yeah, yep. nothing crazy. So that's a, another way to find it. But yeah, get, get a script down so you know the things that you're saying to the person. You know, get something down and it's, you don't want to be robotic about it, but you want to make sure that you're mentioning three or four things. Are these your concerns? And if they are, then you, you, you have a higher likelihood of putting a deal together Excellent. and be, and be pre-qualified, be pre-qualified, have done your work, have gotten all the stuff done with your mortgage broker. Make sure that mm-hmm. you can show yourself to the prospective seller that you've already done your work, that you've already got things in order and that you're not like fingers crossed going for approval <laughs> and hope this works out. Like, don't right. waste your time. Don't waste theirs. Be approved. Have a, a commitment letter. Have all of that stuff in place. That's going to help get them across the border of, yeah, I think it might be time to move on. Yes. Really good imp- important tips, Matt. Really appreciate it. Sure. And where can people find you? So lumberjacklandlord.com, Lumberjack Landlord on YouTube. And we are live streaming 11 a.m. Eastern time on Sunday. So if you want to ask questions live, I welcome them. And if it's too hard of a question, I'll just have to go back to my nerdery and figure it out and then send you an email (laughs) afterwards. But uh, yeah, looking forward to having as many people there as possible just to have some fun and talk some real estate and, uh, you know, talk about ideas. Yeah, I'll be there. Can't wait for it. Awesome, Ariel. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for the time. All right. Thanks, Matt. You too. Take care.